Hey people, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible and that together we can make it happen. I'm Manda Scott, your host at this place on the web where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, and science meets spirituality, all in the service of conscious evolution and increasingly in the service of mapping a way through to a future that we would be proud to leave to the generations that follow. And this is the start of a new season. These are always entirely arbitrary, but I'm starting this one because it's a month before the opening of Thrutopia. And as we take our writers through six months of how a generative future could actually look and work and feel, what the nuts and bolts would actually be like, I want the podcast to support that, to reflect it, and to give to the people who are not joining the masterclass a sense of really what we can begin to do. And so this week's guest is Professor Steve Keane, who's Associate Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Western Sydney, and who is also standing for Parliament in the elections that will be coming very soon. Professor Keane was one of the very few economists to realise that an economic crisis was on the way and to warn of it way back in December 2005. This obviously the crisis that happened in 07, 08. And he's been an anti-orthodox economist since the 70s. He's written a number of really inspiring books. I would recommend Debunking Economics, but it is very much an economist's book. His newer book, The New Economics, A Manifesto, which is what drew him to my attention, is well worth any of us reading because he's beginning to look at not only how and why does the current system really not work, why is it, in fact, driving us to the edge of extinction, but what could we do that's instead? Right. And so that's what we explore in this podcast. What's wrong? And much more importantly, how can we fix it? So people of the podcast, please do welcome Professor Steve Keane. So Professor Steve Keane, welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast and thank you for taking the time out of a Bangkok evening, I believe, but you're travelling tomorrow. Uh, yeah, back to back to Amsterdam, that's sort of getting some personal stuff fixed up and dropping into London as well to get some banking fixed up because, of course, you can't close bank accounts when you're not in the country where you open it. Oh, really? Back I come to London for banking reasons only. Oh, as, as half the world seems to do, including the Russians. Uh, we'll maybe get to that. So Kate Rayworth, who is one of my other economics heroes, you, I have to say, have recently moved to the top of the list, considers herself to be a renegade economist. And I read both of your books, Debunking Economics and then The New Manifesto, and I loved it. Uh, But then I'm a pseudo-economist. I did a master's at Schumacher, so I'm not a real economist, but I've, I've done enough to appreciate the work. And it seemed to me that that you're a pirate economist. You're not just doing things differently. You're actually blowing the old economy out of the water. It did feel like, oh, look, here comes another missile. <laughs> Gone. That's that entire... And, and, and you've got the mathematics to back it up. And I don't want to spend the rest of the podcast confusing people with, with the machinations of economics. But a couple of things that I wanted to pick up on in general theory. And the first one was that it's not an accident that we get to a point of let's call it orthodox economics, just to not confuse people with lots of names, where everybody in the general public genuinely believes there is no alternative, that this is the way the world is. I can't, Franklin, Jameson, I think you said, it's easier to imagine the end of humanity than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And in the general sense, if you speak to ordinary people in the street, this is the case. And I wonder, for the people listening who exist in that world, can you give the very edited highlights of why there is an alternative? And, and we'll get to then what that alternative might be. Well, actually, I'll start, I'll start from the philosophical point that I'm reaching, and that is that the only uh, feasible alternative for humanity is to be the guardian of life on this planet. If we're not the guardians of life on this planet, we will not be able to live on this planet either. Now, is capitalism the best system to guard life? No, 
In fact, you have to constrain that side of humanity. It's an incredibly powerful system for innovation, and that's important. Under the period which we call capitalism, humanity's knowledge of how the universe functions has grown, has grown dramatically. But that has largely been done by people who themselves aren't capitalists, you know, from Newton to Einstein. Um, so human knowledge uh, is, is an incredible resource, which I would hate to see us lose. Uh, but to sustain it for the indefinite future, at least on this planet, we can't have capitalism as the dominant social system. In outer space, whenever we get there, maybe, but not on this planet because you cannot treat this planet as a place you plunder first, profit second, and depopulate third, which is what we're going to end up doing, not to ourselves initially, but certainly to the other forms of life on the planet. So we have to become custodians of life and fit capitalism inside that. Beautiful. Yay. And I think I would suggest even in outer space, because capitalism doesn't just destroy other species, it destroys anyone who isn't at the top of the capitalist pyramid. So even in outer space, I would imagine that capitalism is going to be very destructive of the people not at the top. Although I do, I had a friend once who was part of the medical team in Goldman Sachs. And what I realized was that they were right at the top of the capitalist heap. But within Goldman Sachs, they had a completely socialist structure where if the lowest quant's uncle was ill in India, they got flown to the same specialist as if the CEO was ill because they didn't want anybody worrying about health care for themselves or their families. So they had created a totally socialist, utterly even system egalitarian within Goldman Sachs. It was just that you had to be in Goldman Sachs, which is right at the top of the pyramid, to benefit from it. Well, a similar thing applies to, I mean, even I'm not going to eulogise uh, Elon Musk necessarily here, but it's the same sort of thing applies inside those sorts of companies because you want people, but if you think inside a company itself, a company is not organised in a capitalist way. Okay? And this is one of the, one of the ironies of capitalism that the economic theorists themselves haven't properly got their heads around, at least the, the mainstream hasn't. Corporations are command and control systems. They exist inside a market economy. Now, you can have a command and control system like the one, like, you know, you're, you're saying the top of, of the, you know, that particular uh, member of the vampire squid fraternity. Uh, they, they treat everybody as socialists inside while they are rapacious towards the outside. Um, so, but inside every corporation is a command and control system, and they exist in the market. So, the market, in effect, if you like, is like the water. The the the, the fish that swim in those are command and control systems we call corporations. Okay, that would be a rabbit hole we could go down, but but we might get back to it later. <laughs> so, just before we head further down, I'd like to know how you became someone who is so radically opposed to the broad mainstream of economics, most economists still believe there is no alternative. They still adhere to the models of neoclassical economics. What was the turning point for you when you realised that this is not a functional system? It's actually quite theoretical and that, and actually it occurred in my first year at university in 1971. And actually July of 1971, if I can give a date to it. And the reason was we had a, a brilliant new lecturer called Frank Stilwell, who was actually a, an immigrant from, his, from England, uh, don't worry, Frank actually did his degree, but he did his PhD in England and came out to Australia lecturing at the University of Sydney. And Frank had become disillusioned himself with mainstream economics. He would have been 28, I imagine, at the time. He's now 78 or close to, close to 80 and uh, still a radical. But Frank had become disillusioned, so he had the first year economics course. And as part of that, he gave a lecture on what's called the theory of the second best. Now, that sounds quite esoteric, but when you, when you learn neoclassical economics, and you don't even know at the time you're learning it that it's neoclassical, you think that it just is economics, there is no alternative, as you were saying beforehand. And what you learn is that the world is the best possible world is one where there's no concentrations of any type. So you have corporations all being small, individual, competitive corporations, and workers being small, obviously, individual, competitive workers. And that'll give you the ideal situation. And in that ideal situation, everybody receives what they should receive as an income. Mm. So it's got a, a meritocratic and egalitarian touch to the market. But then what Frank said, well, this thing called the theory of the second best says, what if you're two steps away from that perfect situation. So you have trade unions representing the workers and you have employer organisations 
representing the employers, and they're currently bargaining, and that's what's that's what's setting the, the the wage. Are you better off if you abolish one or the other? And according to conventional economic theory, you make welfare worse if you abolish one or the other. You've got to get rid of them both at the same time. Right. Now, I remember learning this in the lecture theatre and thinking, what? Because before that, and I remember writing a first-year essay about how we should abolish trade unions and monopolies, you know, but I thought, hang on a second, you can't possibly imagine abolishing them both at the same time. This is just crazy. Now, what's going on? Because here is a theory that I thought explained the real world really well, and it, I, I felt very much committed to this meritocratic view of how wages are determined and how profits are determined and so on, and suddenly I got this crazy result that if you want to live in this perfect world, you've got to change everything that's imperfect about the real world at the same time. I thought, that's nonsense. There's got to be something wrong with the theory if it leads to this result. So I checked my textbook. Of course, there was no mention of this theory in the textbook. You only got taught this if you uh, went on to an honours degree or a master's degree, PhD qualifying, then you might learn about it. But at this stage, you ended up being so committed to this vision of capitalism as a perfect meritocratic system that you regarded that as an interesting little curly thing to be forgotten about. Well, learning it in the first year, hang on a second, my brain hadn't been rewired to think completely like an economist. So I went down to the library and looked up the original reference. And at this stage, I was studying first-year mathematics, which was easily enough to cope with the mathematics of the paper. So I realised, okay, it was impeccable. It was very accurate. I think the the authors were either nominated for or got the Nobel Prize for this work. So it was a work of high status. But it was ignored by the the rest of the mainstream. And then I thought, what else am I not being taught? So I went to the... Uh, economics journals, and this is back in the days when journals were all physical, of course. There was no such thing as an e-journal, and stuff took time to be um, bound. So I just grabbed the first bound copy. It happened to be, the, I think it was the 1966 or 69 volume of the Economic Journal, and there I found a I think it was 66, actually. I, the others were unbound and, you know, waiting to be bound, and, and it would come back at some point after they'd been because they were binding journals for thousands of journals to the library. And there's a paper by Paul Samuelson, who was the most prominent economist alive at the time, and it said, it's called a summing up, and in this paper he admitted that the theory of meritocratic income distribution that I was being taught in first-year economics lectures was mathematically unsound as a result of what's called a debate between Cambridge, UK and Cambridge, Massachusetts, called the Cambridge Controversies. And his, as the representative of the American side, which was fighting for the main, the mainstream conservative stuff, he conceded defeat. He said, we're wrong. And the final line said, if this makes you nostalgic for the old time parables of neoclassical economics, we should remind ourselves that scholars are not born to live an easy existence. Wow. Now that should have been throw out what you're being taught and start all over again, but no, no, no. Same old crap still being taught. And today, if you ask any economist who knows about the Cambridge controversies, without knowing it carefully, of course, they will think the neoclassicals won that debate. Oh, isn't that interesting? So I just realised I was being taught a mendacious theory, and that's when my my change began way, way back in first year university at the age of 18. Good man. Very good man. Because it seems to me reading relatively broadly, but not at great depth, because I'm not a mathematician and my brain tends to fuse quite early on, Mm. that economics is the pseudo cover for a political movement. And what they do then is that they find enough mathematics to confuse basically everyone who's not a really hardcore mathematician to be able to go, okay, this is this is fact now, we've got the maths. And it's covering an a political belief system. And that's came home to me very strongly with the Larry Summers Yanis Varoufakis. Mm. conversation about in and out groups. Can you tell us, just tell us that, because then we can lead on in from there to what we're going to do about this. Well, that's actually another another book you should recommend to your listeners as well, which is uh, Adults in the Room by Yanis Varoufakis. Yes, yes. I've got to say, like, Yanis is a close friend of mine. Who is he? But that reads like, that book reads like a novel. It's a fabulous read. 
And I recommend it to anybody to get a feeling for what actually happened to Greece and Giannis as a human being as well and so on. But it opens with uh, Giannis meeting up in some, I think it was in Washington, going to meet in some strange bar somewhere and waiting for somebody to come and meet him. And the person says, you made a big mistake, Giannis. And the Giannis says, well, what's that mistake? He said, you got elected. And that was Larry Summers saying, which, of course, I'm now running for election myself in Australia, by the way. Uh, So that's quite, you know, Giannis and I have something in common now. I might make the same mistake he made. But the point that, you know, know, that that was Larry Summers who made that comment. And then Larry in the conversation said, you're you're now prominent enough to become part of the in crowd. But one of the rules of the in crowd is in crowd members don't criticise other in crowd members. So once you're accepted, if you are accepted, you can't criticise me, you can't criticise Joe Stiglitz, et cetera, et cetera. And Giannis, and bless his cotton socks, said, no, I'm going to remain an outsider. I'm much more comfortable being that. And the same thing applies to me. So we, we were rebels. We met uh, together in, I think, 1991 uh, when he turned up at Sydney University as a lecturer and I was starting to do my, uh, I was finished my master's and starting to do my PhD. So, uh, yeah, but that's the, the, the idea that there's only one way to think about the economy is, first of all, wrong, because if you do the mathematics properly, and this has been done not just by me, by a whole range of mathematically talented economists, some from the mainstream themselves, so they've shot their own feet off, but others, critics from the outside, have disemboweled the damn thing. If, that's, if there's no other alternative, then there's no way to think about the economy at all, because every last supposed mathematical foundation of neoclassical economics has been falsified. Blown out of the water, yes. Either empirically or theoretically. So, you know, there has to be an alternative because everything they've done is wrong. Excellent. Okay, so I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of, of let's let's look at all the maths because we will confuse people. But you said earlier that one of the things that struck you when you realised that the Cambridge controversy had been won by the other side is that if we change everything that's wrong about the real world simultaneously, then things will fall apart. Nevertheless, we're in a situation where the real world is in a very fragile state in terms of the climate and ecological emergency. Mm. We have a global political and economic system where there are people continuing with business as usual, as if the climate emergency didn't exist. And it has always seemed to me that the only way around this is to change the economic system fundamentally and change the political system at the same time. And you're standing for office, so we can go into how we might change the political system in a moment. How would you, if you gained office, supposing you not only got elected, but you got elected and had the capacity to then pull together a cabinet and change the political and economic structure of Australia, which is a pretty major player in the world, and make of it a beacon of how we could do things, Mm. how would you begin to restructure the economy in a way that isn't going to kill thousands of people, millions of people, as the old economy falls off a cliff? Well, I'll put forward the one thing I want to bring in, and and that is something that uh, I'm working on with an English uh, activist called Adam Hardy, by the way, uh, which is called Universal Carbon Credits. Because the biggest threat we face in terms of the sustainability of human civilization is what we're doing to the obviously the ecology in general, but the most specific part is carbon dioxide, uh, global warming. And we have, if, if we are to, to stop damaging the ecosphere at the most critical way we're doing it, then we have to reduce the amount of carbon as, and as fast as possible. But all the schemes which have been put forward are about how do we change the price of carbon as if we can work out a price which will mean Antarctica doesn't melt. Right. Of course, we can't. We can work out a quantity uh, which Antarctica won't melt. And we may, be, we may be past that point, okay? We may have already tipped that particular catastrophic system ourselves. But we need some way to physically restrain the amount of carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere. So the, the scheme that I've come up with and Adam came up with before me independently was the idea of universal carbon credits, a bit like a universal basic income. So everybody would get a universal carbon credit every day through a parallel monetary system, which could be run by the central bank or could be run through the private banks as well, where the carbon credits were created by the government. And initially what I would do is set them, set those carbon credit 
equal to the average for a particular country. So every UK resident would get the average carbon consumption of the UK that day, every Australian and so on. So let's stick with Australia. We'd, we'd each get a carbon credit equal to the average. And then every commodity you bought would have two prices. It's current money price and, of course, your own cash flow determines what you could pay out of that, and it's carbon price. Now, because of the inequality of distribution of income, 95% of the population would not exhaust their carbon credits, but the top 5% would. And so if they wanted to continue shopping, they would have to buy carbon credits off the poor. Okay. So there'd be a direct trend. The, the rich would have to buy something off the poor, okay? And the poorer you were, the more you'd have to sell because the lower your carbon consumption would be. Right. So the, the, what I want to do is, 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 is put as much pressure on the rich to reduce their carbon consumption as possible to initially benefit the poor because when you try to put a price on carbon, everybody has to pay the price and incomes are being unequal. The, the poor can't afford it, whereas the rich can. And we need something that the rich, rich can, can, who can afford it can pay and the poor benefit. So the idea of the universal carbon credit would be to do that and then that would both encourage the rich to dramatically reduce their carbon consumption, to really encourage technological development of products which reduce carbon consumption radically, and it would give income distribution in favour of the poor out of the current system. So that's the, that's, that's the thing I most want to achieve. Okay, so can we unpick how that works? So supposing... Um I have a sack of potatoes that I want to sell you. Mm. Or no, let's suppose there is a sack of potatoes and you're rich and I'm poor. And the sack of potatoes then, let's say let's it costs a US dollar and it also would cost five carbon credits? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, we know if you, if you go shopping you know, in, in any supermarket, of course, I'm thinking in terms of a, a standard retail system, you pick up a pack and you'll see 25 ingredients listed. Well, I'd make the 26th ingredient or the first ingredient the carbon content. And so when you went to swipe it at the checkout, uh, as well as saying, okay, that's going to cost you a dollar for that kilo of potatoes or a pound, uh, then it would also say, and it's going to cost you your X carbon credits, where that presents the carbon content. So it's just like a bank account and would run down the same way a bank account does. And when your carbon credits are out... Then, so if you're rich and I'm poor and you've, you've run out of carbon credits and you still want the potatoes, you could presumably through an app structure bid for my carbon credits and, and whoever I bid the most, if we're in a capitalist structure, I could sell your, your offering 10 pence per carbon credit and a, a guy down the road is offering 8 pence per carbon credit, so I sell you my carbon credits. Yep. I then get more money, but I then have fewer carbon credits. So I'm going to run out of carbon credits quite fast also. Or is it just that I well, I don't need as many potatoes? You, you, you'll have surplus carbon credits. I mean, right. if you, you because income is so income and wealth are so badly skewed in capitalism now, if you set the universal carbon credit on a daily basis at the average carbon consumption per person in a country, then probably ninety percent, at least ninety percent, more likely ninety five percent would already be consuming less than that. They'd never exhaust their credits. Right. Whereas the top 5% are exhausting it, you know, as soon as they, as they, as soon as they get out of their satin sheets, they're exhausting it. Yeah, they turn on the shower, that's their carbon gone for the day. Have you said, you said, well, that's um, that show about the, uh, the Netflix show about the becoming Anna or inventing Anna, the woman who was a, a con artist who ripped off American uh, high society in New York. Um, uh, there's one stage where this poor journalist and her boyfriend, her husband rather, go and stay in a wealthy person's house and she comes in to find him lying on the floor. And the reason he's lying on the floor, he says, come down here, you've got to feel this. And the floor's temperature is in Fahrenheit, 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. The floor is heated to the level where it's exactly the same as your skin level, so you don't feel any cold as you walk across a tiled floor. <laughs> That's why I'm saying as soon as they get out of their satin sheets, they've already more than exhausted their, their quota. So the rich would have to pay far more to buy what they need, and that would, A, distribute income back to the poor, and, B, it would put enormous pressure on them to reduce their carbon footprints, both by consuming less but also by saying, you know, I'm not going to buy that you know, a gas-powered car, I'm going to buy an electric, et cetera, et cetera, huge pressure to change our consumption patterns. So that's the thing I most want to achieve. And does this extend 
internationally with a common carbon currency? No, for one very simple reason. If you want to stop something happen, happening, make it international. Okay. Okay. If you, there was actually a, 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 a wonderful, a, a couple of uh, renegade journalists went to interview, I've forgot, forgotten where they were, where were from, but one of these you know, renegade journalist groups, and they interviewed a, um, a bunch of consultants in Washington as if they were going to buy their services to, um, you know, con some policy they wanted through the government. And these consultants were bragging about how they managed to prevent action on climate change. And one way they did it was by supporting a carbon tax because they knew there was no chance of the tax ever passing through Congress. So I have the similar attitude to international agreements. If you want to make sure nothing gets done, try to make sure it happens at the international level because some country, normally my own country, of course, Australia, will block it. So let's do it at the national level. That's a, we, we, we have a functioning polity at the national level. Let's do it at that level. And then after it's working at the national levels, maybe then we can talk about coordinating, but let's get it done at the national level first. Excellent. Okay. So at the time of recording, there's still an interesting war happening between Russia and Ukraine. Mm. As far as I understand it, no country in the world counts its military carbon output in its overall CO2, because that's a national mm. secret, because otherwise you could work out how many planes we've got. I, I think there might be ways to do that without that. But anyway, carbon budgeting in the military doesn't happen. I am watching a war happening, which as far as I can see, is going to spike our CO2 right through the roof and probably mm. blow any chance of us staying under two degrees. In your modelling, have you extended this to military carbon outputs in any any nation or is it purely at the moment domestic consumption it has to be domestic consumption i think uh, i mean you know the military is something we have to address but to try to start by reforming the military i mean you know <laughs> how many oxymorons do you want in one conversation uh so i i think you know the military is, is a clearly important issue but uh, if you try to restrain you know, the carbon output of the military, you're likely to get the carbon output of the military directed at you. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, so in behavioural terms, positive reinforcement works better than than punishment. And, and I'm imagining that the people who are used to being able to buy whatever they want will get quite cross when they discover they can't. I hope so. But they have a tendency to find loopholes. And I'm wondering, is there a carrot as well as a stick? Is there, other than, hey guys, you know, extinction is coming, it would be really good to do something, which is manifestly not a narrative that works because we've tried it for a good number of decades and it's not made any difference. How do we persuade the the super rich who just are so used to being able to get whatever they want that at some core limbic level, they're really going to fight if they can't. How can we help to persuade them that this is a thing that they want to do? Is there any carrot in there? Well, there is another uh, group uh, led by a guy called Denton Chen. Uh, and, and Denton is providing a carrot system where you get rewarded uh, for innovations that reduce carbon, uh, carbon uh, overheads. So the two can work together, but equally you, know, you can see the extent to which there's gaming of positive incentives. Now, uh, that makes it very hard. Uh, uh, you know, co corporations are so good at evading tax, okay, so good at uh, exploiting things like carbon offsets and so on, that I think there's very strong problems either way. Um, they're more likely to go for Denton's scheme initially than mine. Uh, and to some extent, I would just... I simply want to have the structure set up to enable the scheme I'm talking about. If it doesn't get implemented before we have a crisis, I could cope with that as long as it exists once we have a crisis. Because if you if you walk into a crisis and you don't have a structure in place to cope with the aftermath of that crisis, then that's when you start falling apart. So, you know, I'd set mine up initially as a, a parallel banking system, uh, which could be used for any purpose. That could include, for example, tax rebates. Okay. But something which is a parallel monetary system uh, to enable the government, which would actually have to, of course, create the universal carbon credits in the first place or create something else. They could use it any means they like so long as it exists. I just want it in place. Okay. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Strikes me we're actually in the crisis, so getting it in place quite fast would be a really good idea. Are, are you going to have the currency on the blockchain 
or, or how do you imagine the currency would function? I'm no great fan of, of, uh, of, of blockchain. Uh, I mean, I, I wish I'd taken advice of some of my friends back when they told me to buy Bitcoin when it was 10 quid. Okay, my financial problems would be rather smaller now, but it's, I've never regarded it as money. And I think that one of the first things is going to be abolished uh, when we realise we've drastically overstretched our energy consumption will be cryptocurrencies that rely upon proof of proof of, uh, of work. But I'm working with a number of guys who are using cryptocurrencies that don't rely on proof of work. Yes, because Bitcoin is an utter disaster. But some of them. But the, the trouble is, the, the, see, the, in, in anything like this is. The, the crazy thing about cryptocurrency is that it came in on the idea we want a trustless system. You want a system for money transfer, which you don't have to trust anybody, okay? But if you have a, a new world where there's no longer fiat currencies, then which cryptocurrency are you going to trust to be the one that will replace the fiat system? Are we all going to trust the same one, hmm. okay, et cetera, et cetera? Should we trust Ethereum? Should we trust Bitcoin. My point being, obviously, that you can't get away from having to trust in a social system. So the whole idea that there should be a trustless form of money, I think, is a mistake. Okay. But we develop a carbon credit that we can trust. And as you project forward 10, 15, 20 years, assuming the climate is stable enough that long, are you assuming that the carbon credit becomes the dominant form of currency? Well, I'm assuming we're going to have an ecological crisis. I mean, my, my position is that we're not, um, you know, tapering towards two degrees over pre-industrial. We're drastically in overshoot in the pressure we put upon the planet. Okay. And so at some point, the planet is going to tell us that you have two choices. You can cut back or you can become extinct, not necessarily human humanity in general, but human societies could fail. Um, so that that is my overall framework. And uh, in that world, if, if we do get into that world, then uh, absolutely um, the first thing we have to do drastically cut back is carbon consumption, mm. and that means rationing in some sense. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think it would become dominant. Uh, I want to at least have a possible of existing uh, because, you know, I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> I spend most of my life hoping that I'm wrong. But uh, on this one, if I'm... If, if I'm wrong, then it's just a, you know, a cumbersome and tedious system. We innovate for no good reason. But if I'm right, we have a way of uh, having both commerce of some description and control of consumption as we reduce our consumption to the scale where it's feasible on the biosphere. So let's play a slightly different imaginal game. Suppose the youth of the world, everybody under 40, possibly everybody under 30. But anyway, a reasonably large mass of people got themselves together, mm. that's capable now with the internet, and said, you know what, the boomers have really screwed us. And now is the time for us as young people to instigate something completely different. If you want to carry on with your military economic industrial complex over there, then we are not going to stop you, but we're going to do it differently. If you were going to model an economic system that would work and wouldn't end up with us tipping over too many tipping points. Let's leave aside the ones that we're already careening towards anyway. Let's pretend that there is still a gap. Mm. How would your ideal economy function? Well, it has to have limit, limits on the degree of inequality. I mean, but the first thing that uh, the, the, the logical failing of neoclassical economics mm. is arguing that the income depends on merit, which it doesn't. Okay, so you have any, any human society will have inequality. It's uh, it, it, virtually any structure has inequality built into it. But human society tends to have a inequality from you know from from the from the days of uh, agrarian societies forward. So that inequality has to be restrained. And like in Japanese corporations, at one stage, I think back in the nineteen eighties had either a rule or a practice that the chief executive earned no more than 100 times the lowest pay level of the company. Now you'd look at you know, the ratio must be over 1,000 to 1. Uh, and there's an enormous layer of people in finance who earn just gigantic salaries, uh, uh, which are, you know, the, nobody ever called somebody in finance an essential worker. When you have a breakdown, the essential workers are the garbage men, the, the nurses, the doctors, the People are maintaining the internet these days. Those are your essential workers. And yet they get paid terrible wages because they can't afford to organise 
Uh, they can't afford to strike. We, we can't have them strike. Okay. And uh, they're at the bottom of the hierarchy, the social hierarchy. So you need to restrain how high that inequality gets. So that'd be the first thing. What would your ratio be? Something well, 100 to 1 is feasible. Yeah. Pla- Plato said 20 to 1. Oh, that's all th- fantastic. If you, if you look at, you know, the, like, the, you, would, you would hope to have uh, the person at the, the bottom of the hierarchy having a living wage. So if you're earning 100 times a living wage. It's still a good amount. Yeah. That's pretty good. Now, the, the, what, you get, what you're getting these days is 10,000 times a living wage, and that's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I gather just before the economic crash that you predicted, it was 350,000 to one. Oh, my God. Of some of the bankers in the US compared to the people in the US on, on what it was then their baseline wage, which is, is functionally insane. Mm. Okay, so we have limits to inequality, which are legislated. Having got that, I'm very interested in your views on taxation and without us getting too geeky about it, mm. you've already spoken about universal basic income. I'm guessing universal basic services would, would also be a thing and that then there would be yeah. a redistribution. We have already spoken to Richard Murphy on this podcast, so there is a, a basic understanding of modern monetary theory. But if you could, mm. for people who haven't gone back that far, could you explain how money actually works as opposed to how the orthodox economists want us to think it works? Yeah. Okay. Well, the simplest thing is, if, let's say, say what, is, what is money in the first place? How do you define it? And fundamentally, in modern society, money is what's in your bank account. Okay? So if you're going to create money, you've got to add to bank accounts. If you're going to destroy money, you've got to take money out of bank accounts. That's, that's the first principle. Then when you look at the... Uh, the uh, banking sector, because we put our money in bank accounts, and bank accounts are called liabilities of the bank because uh, the money shown in your bank account, the bank is liable to give that to you if you ask for it. So the banking sector has assets, which are, include our uh, the money we've deposited with them. It includes loans they've created and so on. And then it has liabilities, which are our bank accounts, and it has short-term equity as well, the bank's own money for Long for, for, uh, for its own daily updated operations. So if you want to create money, you've got to add to it liabilities or the short-term equity of the banking sector. Okay. Now, to do that, you've got to also add to the assets. And that's part people don't get their heads around unless they've done sort of study that I've done or they've done an accounting degree. But if you uh, imagine you go to the bank and you, you deposit a £100, a £100 note, if there's such a thing. Okay. Well, the bank it goes to the teller, the teller puts it in a chute, it goes to the downstairs and gets put in the vault. So that's the asset of the banking sector. And then they record on your deposit account, now those are done electronically, an extra £100. So that increases the bank's liabilities and increases the bank's assets. Okay? So that's the basic mechanism. To create money, you have to both increase the assets and increase the liabilities of the banking sector. And there's two fundamental ways you can do that. The bank can lend out more than it gets back in repayments, and that means its loans rise, which are its assets, and its liabilities rise, which are the deposits, because when you borrow money from a bank, it says, that's a great idea, here's a million pounds to buy that property in Putney, uh, and you owe us a million pounds at the same time. So the assets rise and the liabilities rise. Can we just stop there? Because this is the thing that I think people don't understand, is that the bank just made a million pounds out of thin air. They typed it into a That's spreadsheet right, yeah. and it existed. And then they sold it to you or to me at whatever is the current interest rate. Mm. And they therefore not only created money out of thin air, which technically is theirs, they then sell it to us and we have to create the, let's say, 6% to give them back on a, on a cumulative basis because it's not just interest at one time unless we happen to be able to pay off our mortgage all in one go. And I think... This is the thing. I think it was Ben Bernanke who said if people ever actually understood how the banking system made money, there would be a revolution. It was actually John Kenneth Galbraith who said that, yeah. And also Henry Ford, but uh, let's not go too far back. Henry is actually a, a fascist. Where people don't, aren't actually conscious of that. And I, yeah, I, I, the Positive Money Foundation over in the UK once did a survey, it was 2014, mm. of, of all the MPs in Parliament and discovered that fewer than 10% actually understood where money came from. And I'm guessing that since everything's moved to the right and we have a bunch of ideologues there now, that even fewer now understand where money comes from. Yeah, but it, it, it's, it, it is incredibly simple. Okay? And, and that's why you've got to go back to first principles to understand it. Banks 
uh, they're accounting machines. And the accounting is based on assets and liabilities and equity. And your assets minus your liability equals your equity. That's the rule applies to all of us. Um, so if they want to, the, what we've given them is the right to create their own assets if they create liabilities at the same time where those liabilities are our deposit accounts. So banks create money by lending more than they get back in deposits or in re repayments, pardon me. And the, the government creates money by putting money in uh, entries in the reserves of the banks, which are on the asset side and in our deposit accounts as well. So governments create money by spending more than they take back in taxation. Banks create money by lending more than they, take, than they get back in repayments. And so therefore, the total amount of money circulating in the economy, if we assume it's an island like Britain or the UK, and we, we forget for a moment that there's international trade yeah. in money, but you've got a closed system, the amount of money circulating in the economy is the amount created by the government and the amount created by the banks as, generally speaking, private debt. Mm. And I think this is one of the other things that people don't realise. When the government says, oh, we have, to, we have to cut down on government debt because otherwise we're burdening future generations, which is the worst bollocks possible, mm. then the only way that money continues to circulate in the economy at the same flow rates is if people take out more debt and get the banks, therefore, to create more money, and then they create more pressure on their own shoulders. And the alternative would be for the government to create more money and allow it to circulate in the economy. And my right-wing friends are always absolutely terrified of the creation of inflation. If governments create mm. money, then it creates inflation. And the fact that they created 638 billion during the last crash and it created no inflation at all doesn't ever seem to actually end yeah. on them. So can you explain to people who are not economists or accountants and don't really get the maths why governments creating money is not a bad thing? Okay. Uh, it comes back to, to then that whole framework I was talking about assets and liabilities and equity. And I'm focusing here just on financial assets. And a financial asset is your claim on somebody else. Financial liability is somebody else's claim on you. Now, if you, and that doesn't include houses, by the way. If you own a house, then it's your asset and it's not a liability for anybody else. So I'm looking... As long as you own it. Most people, the bank, own their house until they paid off the mortgage. No, even if, well, yeah, if you own a bank. So if, you, if you own a house, yeah. Um, then it's your asset, nobody's liability. They're called non-financial assets. But financial assets are your claim on somebody else. Okay. Um, so if you add up all assets, all financial assets and all financial liabilities, you get zero. Okay. Now, if you then look at the banking sector, what about the, how do banks operate? Is it looking at banks as part of the economy? Well, a bank by definition has to have assets greater than its liabilities. You can only become a bank if you raise equity, okay, and then you get a banking license and you're allowed to establish yourself, and if you start, let's say, with 100 million pounds in equity, let's say, as a very small bank, then your assets are 100 million pounds and your liabilities are zero. And then you make your first set of loans and your loans increase your assets, but they also increase your liabilities. And the question of just how far you go is how big a ratio do you end up having between your loans, between your liabilities and your equity? Okay, but, but a bank has to be in positive equity. Now, that means the banking sector has to be in positive equity. So if you look at the banking sector versus the rest of the economy, the rest of the economy is necessarily a negative equity to the banking sector. Okay. Now, who enjoys being a negative equity? The answer is no one, okay? Because if you actually sit down and say, well, what, what, what do people owe me and what do I owe people? Oh, dear, I owe people more than they owe me. That's terrible. I might go and borrow some money and go gamble on the stock market, or I might go buy some cryptocurrency and speculate on that. So a huge part of irrational behaviour by us is driven by the fact, the necessity, that because the banking sector is in positive equity, the rest of the economy is an identical negative equity to the banking sector. And that creates troppo behaviour, frankly. Okay? So you have to look at it, uh, the overall system and say, well, who in a society can actually cope with being a negative equity all the time. And individuals, well, you can if you cash flow at your service, the, the, the net claims you have, but that's difficult for, some, for a lot of people. The banking sector can't. That's right. Nobody likes having you know, liabilities exceeding their assets. But the government can because ultimately the government you know, is, is the entire country. So it's 
it, we actually use its liabilities as the way to maintain tr trade amongst ourselves. And uh, if you go back in history and say, well, what preceded the days of relying upon government-created money? One thing I do cover in that, that second book, The New Economics, The Manifesto, is the work of uh, Harvard law professor Christine Dassan, who looked at the establishment of the kingdom, the kingdom of King Offa, in the period between uh, the Roman rule and then the final development of the, um, uh, you know, the Norman, the Norman conquests and so on. And back in those back in those days, when you had a, like a breakdown of a of a monetary system, the way that power was maintained within a kingdom was at the you know the front of a sword. You are required to give us a hundred chickens. Uh, I'll come out and take the hundred chickens. With you know, and if you don't like that, then I'll slit your throat. Okay, that was you know commerce, the, the, that was state public relations between the Romans with their own credit system and then finally the UK developing its credit system based around tally sticks predominantly. Uh, so Offer invented a coin and then what you do is say, well, buy those 100 chickens off you, okay? And then what you get is coins which you can then use for trade with the rest of the people in your culture or your, you know, your kingdom. And in that case, the state created a monetary economy and that led to, you know, the, you, you grow out, grew out of the subsistence period that England fell into after the Roman, uh, Romans left. And, and that sort of coin, as well as being a way for the state to appropriate what it wants from the, from the rest of the economy, was also a means of growing the rest of the economy. And, and the, so the coins were a far, far nicer way for the state to appropriate what it wants. And it had the, the double effect that you could then use that as a basis of commerce because you are going to pay taxation. Okay? So you needed the coins to pay the tax. And then, yeah, and, and that's, that's the essence of modern monetary theory today, to say that the state uh, creates more liabilities for itself than it creates assets. That has the reverse effect on the public, creating more assets for them than liabilities. So the government debt is the record of how much money the government's created. And that money, when it circulates, is debt-free for the recipients. So if you borrow money from a bank, you owe debt precisely that same amount of debt to the bank. But if the government spends more on you than it takes back in taxation, you've got additional money in your bank account above and beyond what you'd have without the government uh, existing. Exactly. And th this is the thing that I think certainly was a paradigm shift for me, is the understanding, if I decide to make some money in my back garden, we live 10 miles from Offa's Dyke. Oh, do you? Okay. Offer, offer. So, um, you know, if I decide to be Offa and make coins, uh, I get arrested because that's not, you know, you're not allowed to do that. That's forgery. Yeah, yeah. But if the government makes money and then spends it, it's that's what governments are for. And then the government takes the money back in tax to even things out. So they tax the rich people more than they tax the poor people in an ideal world. Yeah. And, and they help to create more equity. And the poor people have the money to spend in the economy, or everybody has the money to spend in the economy. But this is, it drives me crazy when people say, you know, we can't afford the NHS. I'm going, well, which, which bit of the spending on the NHS does not come back in tax ultimately? Well, some of, it, some of it doesn't come back, but it shouldn't come back in tax. The government should run a deficit. In the end, it should all come back, unless it's gone to foreign, you know, unless we've sold all our NHS to American. It circulates in the end, and then eventually it all comes back. It's not going anywhere unless we've sold off the NHS and then it all goes to mm. American multinationals. So in our ideal, I still am trying to get to, let's, how do we create, we're very nearly finished, how do we create a better economy that would function in a way that isn't predicated on the annihilation of everything that we value? So we've got a government that's creating Let's assume the government is creating the money. I think letting banks create the money always strikes to me. Do we really need banks? Well, then there's what banks should be doing, and they don't do now, is providing working capital for companies that they personally assess are going concerns. There used to be things called lines of credit that existed 50 or 60 years ago, or overdrafts for small firms, uh, funding for entrepreneurs, and money for large-scale purchases that individuals can't make on their own savings, such as buying a house or a car, uh, but not in such a way that causes bubbles in those assets. So I would want private banks to be doing that rather than relying upon uh, 
a, a government system to be creating those loans. Could they not be community-owned banks? Do they have to be? Yeah, well, the, the building societies were like that. If you look at the, it's actually quite fascinating. If you look at the history of uh, British private debt, you find between 1880 and 1982 or three, the level of private debt in the UK never exceeded 73% of GDP. And then in 1982, that's when Maggie Thatcher deregulated the banking sector and let, let build, the banks muscled in on what building societies used to do. Now, with a building society, you deposit your money in a building society account and the bank, building society deposits that in a bank and there's no money creation. So the, the, when, when Maggie did that, you went from 73% to 220%. Under her and, and, and Blair. And house prices. Houses rocking. prices went through the roof. You got the most expensive housing compared to 1977 of any country on the, uh, in the, in, that I have data for. That's 43 countries. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 that, that was the, the way that it was set up before that deregulation by Maggie uh, was such that you didn't create money when you made a loan for buying a house. And therefore, you didn't create a housing bubble either. So you could just have, you know, cooperatives doing that. That would be feasible. Um, but I'm, you know, conscious of the, the need to get finance to entrepreneurs. And it's incredibly hard as a person who's innovated some new, good, good new idea to get funding for it. So I would want that to be provided in a private way. Positive money has a scheme like that where the banks still exist and they have to lend out of a... Uh, a, fu a, a fund created by the government. I'm still not sure of that being functional because there's such a degree of overheads in banking and there's so many things where you'll lend to somebody who folds and you've got to make your money out of those who don't fold. You may need the ca capacity for money creation by banks. But, I, for example, I'd like to have that through, you know, everybody being given money to give it to crowdfunding. Yes. You know, and they use, use the intelligence of the crowd, something like that. That could replace... The banking, but only at a small scale, like for the sort of thing I do where I'm crowdfunded, that's obviously one potential avenue for it. But if you want to start a microchip, a microprocessor plant, that's a bit too big to imagine crowdfunding the next uh, microprocessor plant. They tend to be two or three billion pounds each. But we have to break the vulture capital. I mean, it seems to me that Facebook and Google are the, the new vampire squids on the face of humanity that they are because the vulture capitalists were there demanding that they mm. get massive returns because they've taken massive risks. Somehow, I would say we have to break that if we're going to have a holistic economy that, that functions and doesn't create massive inequalities. And one of those would be enhancing crowdfunding and saying everybody gets X pounds, X dollars per year that they have to allocate to, okay, to crowdfunding. Uh, so you, you could do something of that nature and then harvest the intelligence of crowds as to what gets funded. Right. Beautiful. Okay. So I'm aware that time is moving on. So let's just, as a last thing, move to your standing for Parliament now in Australia. Hmm. Um, when is the next election? Because there was a point when it might have been now. Yeah, it's it, it, a bit, it can be called an arbitrary date by the by the Prime Minister, but the final date has to be no more than three years after the last election, and that's May 21. So we're thinking it'll either May 14 or May 21. Okay, wow. And he doesn't have to call it... How how far in advance? Is it six, eight weeks? Six weeks. So, it, right. yeah, it, it, I mean, it's better than the American where there's going to be an election permanently. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, but, but you know, uh, our, our Prime Minister only knows how to campaign. He's... He, make, he makes Boris Johnson look skillful. Oh, really? Whoa. Yeah, he's dreadful. So um, we, we, we think he's delaying the election for as long as he can. So we're guessing guessing May 14 because it's embarrassing to have it go the entire three years. Okay, just to give himself a week's, a week's notice. Mm. So if you were to recreate a political system that had a political economic basis of the economic system that we've been suggesting... I'm guessing that first past the post, even with compulsory voting, which you have in Australia, which always strikes me as a really interesting option, um, would probably not be the way that you would choose to structure it to, to use the wisdom of crowds in the way that we could. Have you an idea of how you would, in our new super state that we're going to create that's going to save the world, create a democratic structure that would be more functional than the one that we have at the moment? Oh, well, there's already one. We call it the Hare Clark system after its inventors. And it's used in Tasmania, the Australian Capital Territory, and I think New Zealand. And, and that is a proportional representation at the regional level. So rather than having one person per electorate being elected, I think you have four. 
And it's, if, therefore, anybody gets 20% plus one vote, uh, then they get elected in the Hare Clark system. So, 25%? Uh, no, it's actually, it, 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 it's, 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 it's the number of people being elected plus one. So once you get, if you have, if you, you exhaust the vote, like the top eight, nine, 19.998% of the vote is already covered. Okay. Once, okay. But it's, 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 that, that's the rule. So if you look at the, the Senate I'm being elected from, for example, there are six candidates elected in the Senate in New South Wales, which is a electorate of 5 million people. And if you get um, one seventh of the vote plus one, you get what they call a quota and you therefore get elected. And so that exists in the area that you are standing in? That's right, the Senate. But the Senate, Australian Senate, we have 10 Senate, 12 senators per state. All of them, half of them are elected every election. So there's six positions. And therefore, anybody who gets one seventh of the vote plus one gets elected. And it's 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 also it's option it's pre preferential voting. So people have to vote for up to, for minimum six parties: one, two, three, four, five, six, and then they can ignore the other parties, or they vote for individuals: one to twelve. Right. They can do either way, and then then the votes. It's a very exhaustive system to decide who's actually won. Far far better than the Monty Python esque farce that you guys have in the UK. Yes. Okay. And you also have compulsory voting. Whenever that's suggested over here, people suggest that this is some kind of weird form of fascism and that you shouldn't compel people to vote. <laughs> uh, and instead, we end up with Boris Johnson and his friends in Russia running the country. So how did compulsory voting arise in Australia? And was it considered to be some kind of anti-libertarian at the point when it was imposed? No, I think the, the, the attitude I've always had towards compulsory voting, and I think that was the attitude of the founders as well, is that you make sure everybody who's got the right has to exercise that right, because that way politicians can't spend their time just pressuring minorities that they don't want to have vote to not bother voting. Right. And so if you look at what goes on in America, it's all about how can you exclude people or discourage people from voting and make it harder and harder for them to do it. And finally, they don't even bother. And therefore, only the people who you want to vote for, you vote for you. And you get a... So to me, compulsory voting doesn't control the voters. It controls the politicians. You still end up with quite a right-wing set at the top, though. So it's it's not... We have, unfortunately. So it's not perfect by any means. But we've saying really people haven't understood how the preferential system works. So when you look at it, and like when I've ever voted, I've voted for the Greens, the Marijuana Party, the Sex Party, the Labor Party, and then very last vote I've given to the Liberal Party or to, uh, you know, arch reactionaries over here. So I've been quite conscious of how the preferential system works. And if people think about it properly, then you, you do have the capacity to have a, a very wide representation. And when you look at the Senate level in Australia, the Senate has a large number of people who are minorities, individuals or the Greens, and even at the representative level where we still only have one person being elected per electorate, we have a substantial number of independents and Greens there. So certainly more than you've got in the UK. One. And like America, oh yeah, America is certainly like the reason that we got uh, Bush was because some Americans voted for the Green Party. That gave us Bush. Well, in Australia, you can vote for the Greens and still get Labor. That's interesting. I, I'm trying to design for my book uh, a political system that would work, and I'm really interested in how that functions. Mm. Okay, so very last question. In your book, in the New Manifesto, you detail the way in which certain of the orthodox e economists decided that even at six degrees of global warming, mm. it wasn't really going to affect GDP very much. And and we know on this podcast that GDP is not a useful measure, but let's, I just want to know, I want you to talk us through how they did that. And then I want your opinion of, do they actually believe this? Are they actually functionally insane and stupid? Or is this a political cover for people who don't want action on global warming? They're stupid. Okay. <laughs> but talk us through what they said, what they did, because it's mind-bendingly crazy. The, what they did, and this goes right back to the Limits to Growth. When the Limits to Growth was published, the economist who attacked them most vigorously was a little bloke called William Nordhaus, whom you might know got the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2018 for his work on climate change. And when I went to look at that work, and I only started looking at it in detail in 2018, frankly, uh, uh, I expected to find that it was 
they took what scientists said was going to happen and then applied you know, a discount rate and said, well, we're going to discount the future at 5% per annum. And if you, if you discount the future at 5% per annum for 100 years, what happens in 100 years is trivial. And I thought that's what they did. No one found out was wrong. He assumed, he simply assumed that anything that was done undercover would be unaffected by climate change. This is in a 1991 paper. He says that there are some activities which are exposed to the climate, so agriculture, uh, forestry and fishing. Other activities take place in, quote, unquote, carefully controlled environments, which are negligibly affected by climate change. He gave examples of microprocessor production and uh, surgery. Okay? Well, fair enough. Okay. okay. And then he said 87% of industry is done in carefully controlled environments. All of manufacturing, even included mining, all of services, wholesale and retail services, all of the finance sector, all of government. And what do they have in common? The only thing they have in common is they happen under a bloody roof. So he's pretty much saying if you have a roof, you're safe from climate change. You're, you're fine, climate change. Is but he also did the thing where they looked at uh, I think Michigan and Florida yeah. and decided the temperature difference yeah. between Michigan and Florida was was a certain number of degrees. Therefore, if the whole planet goes up by that certain number of degrees, we're only going to see that amount of difference. Talk us through that because that just that just blew all the fuses in my head. That was the first part I've read of their work, which just left me in just shock at how stupid they were. That's why I say stupid because what they said was that they assume that the effective temperature on income across space, which therefore is comparing one part of America temperature and GD, uh, gross state product to another part of America temperature and gross state product, the, the pattern that applies across space will apply across time. That sounds clever. It's actually effing stupid. It's, it's, it's functionally insane. Yes, no, thank you. Functionally insane because when, when you look at what they're, what they're doing, if you actually say, well, let's see a statistician tries to work out what's the relationship between uh, temperature and income. They'd say, well, there are three things which determine temperature. One is how far we are from the sun, okay? And that's the sun cycles and irrelevant to global warming. Okay? The second is how much of the sun's heat do we retain on the planet? That's what global warming is about. And the third is how far are you are from the equator and how far you are in land from seas and how far above, et cetera, et cetera. The, the data they're looking at is the third factor. And that is irrelevant to global warming. But they've got data on that. They can actually look at, you know, what's the temperature in Michigan and what's the temperature in Florida and then what's the income in Michigan and what's the income in Florida. So we've got data on that. So we can derive numbers for that from actual data. And then let's, let's use those same parameters for the second issue. It's, it's insanely stupid. Just the fact that anyone published that. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's yeah. the kind of thing that a five-year-old might do. And you'd think, well, that was quite a clever thing to do when you're five. Yeah. But these are, these are, as you said, Nobel Prize winning economists. Yeah. And then they're providing, quotes, scientific cover for politicians who want to go, well, you know, GDP will only fall by, what, 5% and uh, per, over 100 years? That's nothing. We don't care. And then you've got to come back to say, where the hell did that come from? And the answer is, these are people who've swallowed the neoclassical Kool-Aid which I rejected in, when I was 18, okay? They've swallowed that Kool-Aid, and that Kool-Aid tells you capitalism is the world's best system. So therefore, because it's the world's best system, it must be able to cope with anything, and therefore climate change can't be a challenge. And that's really what's going on inside their minds. They've, they've been addled by this vision of a perfect system. And they, it took me a long time to really finally accept this, but they have no idea what climate change actually means. They've distorted in such a way that the market system can cope with it. And therefore, they say, well, a four degree increase in temperature will cause 3% damage to GDP. And to quote Nordhaus, 2018, in a paper published in the American Economic Review after he was given the Nobel Prize, he said six degrees of temperature increase will cause, I think, an 8.9 or 7.9% fall in GDP. Now, six degrees of temperature increase, and you should interview Mark Linehouse one of these days about that will probably drive extinct most uh, multicellular life on the planet, okay? Six degrees takes us back to temperature levels that don't quite predate multicellular life, but they certainly predate the dinosaurs. And so if we put that much extra heat into the planet, uh, then the whole structure of the climate becomes something which is 
hostile to to large scale organisms. And we are a large scale organism. So along with everything else, that unfortunately we are. We, de- we depend upon lots of other things that are large scale organisms. So they are completely wrong about what climate change actually is. And they'll dress it up all these fancy statistics with, about numbers that they can actually generate out of current data, which are irrelevant to what we're doing to the planet. Oh, you know, I thought I was going to end us on some kind of a happy note. Okay, so so have you got a plan in place, if you get elected, to get your carbon credits into the Australian government system? And do you think it's likely? The thing I'm kind of going to probably push for is a digital currency uh, run by the central bank, because I think at the moment, Australia does have, uh, when, you, when you pay tax in Australia, you have to give your bank account to the tax office number, the number, of course, and therefore the tax is paid through your bank account. The UK doesn't have that system. As I found when I was there, they're quite crazy. But um, you could then use this, you could use the system as a surrogate bank account. So the money goes to your digital account, then you can transfer it to your actual account. So it would just be another system uh, which would sit there for immediate contact with the public from the government if it was required. And so I'm going to push for a central bank digital currency. Brilliant. And then the carbon currencies can be paid into the central bank digital currency and then we're good to go. Yeah. Okay, that's a good place to stop. Professor Steve Keane, it's been a pleasure and an education. Thank you so much for coming on to the Accidental Gods podcast. Thank you for the invite. And that's it for another week. Enormous thanks to Professor Steve Keane for standing up for so long and so lucidly against the manifest insanity of our current economic belief system. The fact that there is an in-group and the first rule of the in-group is that we don't criticise the in-group is why we are where we are. It's why our journalists on television and in newspapers continue to peddle the concept that the government takes our tax and then spends it rather than the government makes the money out of nothing and then gives it to us and takes back taxation as an effort to even things out. And I think this is, in and of itself, a revolutionary concept. And then if we add Steve's ideas for carbon credits and a government system of banking and universal basic income and universal basic services and a fixed ratio between top and bottom level pay, all of these could be done now. They could be done within our current system without breaking it apart, and causing the havoc that that would wreak. So if you do nothing else after this podcast, go out and talk to people about how money actually works. Call out the lies that we are told about austerity and about the need to suddenly clamp down. We need urgently to cut down on everything that releases carbon. In fact, all of the toxins that we release into the biosphere, those need to stop. And that's not the same as deliberately imposing austerity as an ideological choice so that you can create a permanently terrified population who will do what you want them to do because they're scared of not being able to pay the rent or the mortgage or for food or for heating. It doesn't have to be like this, people. Okay, so rant over. We will be back next week with another very different kind of conversation. And in the meantime... Enormous thanks to Caro C for the music at the head and foot and for the sound production, to Faith Tilleray for the website and the conversations that keep this podcast moving, to Anne Thomas for the transcripts, and, as ever, to you for listening. We wouldn't be here without you. And if you know of anybody else who wants to understand how money actually works and what we could do to change it, then please do send them this link. And that's it for now. See you next week. Thank you. And goodbye.